The year is 50 BC. Gaul is entirely, entirely occupied by the Romans. Well, not entirely. One small village of indomitable Gaul still holds out against the invaders. A life is not easy for the Roman legionnaires to garrison the fortified camp of Totorum, Aquarium, Lodum, and Compendum. I hope you like that intro, because this week we are going to discuss ancient Gaul, and I found fun it funny to do this intro this way this week. And my guest today is Greg Wolf. And as always, I ask, how did you come by ancient Gaul? Was it because of the Asterix and Obelix comics, or was it none other way that you found ancient Gaul appealing? Oh, I'm a huge fan of Asterix, um, but it, it wasn't Asterix that led me to Roman Gaul. I think I just, um, as usual, it's interest you pick up near the end of your time as an undergraduate that um, determine what sort of things you might want to do research mm-hmm. on. I was interested in Roman provinces. Um, I had reasonable French and I'd done quite a lot of art field archaeology. So these are things that combined nicely there. So that's what led me into into writing a PhD in Cambridge um, on um on Roman Gaul and I'm um, studying a bit in Paris and although I've done many other things since I've I've remained interested. Mm. And I want to start beginning with sources because as you know, as you know the Gallic War is probably a massive source that you use but I don't imagine where the girls literate did they, they have their own writing system as or did how do you find researching is archaeology a heavy source for information there? Uh, the populations of late Latin Europe, which is the archaeological term for this, um, many of them did use writing, but we don't have a great deal of it. So we have some rock cut inscriptions and we have inscriptions on portable objects, on swords and so on, and a very small number of larger ones. And they're very difficult to date, but at least some of them are made maybe a century or so before the arrival of Romans in the area. They use letters that are modelled on the Greek alphabet, uh, which uh, was used in Greek cities, particularly Marseille to the south. Um, And the language that they write is uh, very clearly part of that broad set of languages we call Celtic, although there are many different versions of Celtic languages. And we have some inscriptions from the south of France, some from central France and a few from Germany. And they may not all be writing exactly the same language, but... um, uh, but they, they certainly existed. And we have some accounts of, of Gauls using this. And then they carry on making some of these inscriptions um, in the Roman period. And we also even have some inscriptions which blend together uh, Celtic words with, with, with Roman words. So for example, the re- records of the um, ceramic workshops in, um, uh, in central France. And this looks like it's uh, sort of uh, a a blended language with people who probably speak a bit of both and use some technical terms from one language and others. So there, it, it, it was certainly a society that had writing. We don't have a great deal of it. What we don't have are works of literature, but that's true for most of the hundred or so languages spoken in and around the Mediterranean base. And very few of them ended up on papyrus. And those ones that did end up on papyrus, only only a handful survive. We have one book left in Etruscan written on linen, um, most books are written in Latin or Greek, even if in the case of Greek, they're written by Phoenicians or Jews or um, Egyptians. So um, we work with what we have, but it's it's not an unusual situation in, in this period. Is the Gallic world, so, so, sorry, the Gallic War a reliable source as for information on the dependent source for this use of study of ancient Gaul? Uh, Caesar's. Caesar's account is fascinating and there's been lots of new work done on it recently in fact but um, it's a very reliable source of what Caesar wanted you to know about Um, he leaves out a lot of things he doesn't want you to know about either because they're not very interesting to him or don't serve his political ends and we have enough alternative accounts to tell us where he's where he's blurred the boundaries a bit he's um uh, being a bit simplistic in the politics occasionally, representing himself as always fighting for Roman allies against others, where clearly some of the people he fought were Roman allies. Um, he tends to blame disasters on his subordinates and take the credit for success himself. Um, uh, he tends to write up the achievements of everyday Romans, so centurions and so on. And this maybe reminds us that he is a a politician who associated himself with the popular cause. 
he's very keen on moments where he's present but the whole months of the of the year when we don't really know what's what's going on because he wasn't in goal continuously he went south every winter went to do law courts in the south of france went to north italy met with his political allies um schemed for goal is central in the book but it was secondary to his own aims which were all about metropolitan politics so it's a very rich source but it's it's not one which you can sort of mine ethnographically you can't say well you, you can't use a whole field based around the Gallic war and in, in other words i i don't think the situation is different from any other literary source i mean and i think every source has its own agenda but it's uh, we should we always need to remember the methods through which it's produced, what information is available, and crucially, the purposes for which it's designed. So let's start from the very beginning. When do we first have, because the Gauls were in the Europeans, right? When did they first arrive in what would later become France? Um, the language, the Celtic language is an Indo European language, um, but so like Latin and Greek and uh, most of the languages of Western Europe today, German um, and other ones like Hittite and Tokharian and some of the languages of India. Um, we don't know the exactly the process through which it arrived in Western Europe. There are people who think it came from. The southwest and spread eastwards and northwards. That's 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 a minority view, but some pretty influential people hold it. Uh, the whole question about Indo-European migrations has been, um, is is I mean, you should do an entire podcast on this with someone who knows more about it than I do. But the work that's been done on paleo DNA has shown very clearly there's an enormous population replacement, not in the Iron Age but in the Bronze Age, mm -hmm. and so. My guess is that future explanations for the spread of Indo-European will probably want to place it back in that period rather than later. But tying language to archaeology and tying language and, and material culture to actual human population is quite tricky. So when it starts to settle down in villages, as we see, for example, See so there are several villages. There aren't like a united people, are they? But there, when, when, how did when did it start settling down in these villages? Well, people lived in villages in Europe since the Neolithic. So, um, with the origins of farming, you begin to get sedentary populations, and um, so this is a long time. This is you know millennia before Caesar, and. These farming villages, often they're built around one or two long, long houses and then successive populations, Bronze Age, most Bronze Age populations would also have lived in villages. There are periods where people cluster together and periods where they scatter. And so there are and the periods where they cluster together, they build settlements that are more visible to us archaeologically. So at the end of the first Iron Age, the Hallstatt, and at the end of the second Iron Age in France, you get hill forts. Between the two in the early in the early Latin, you don't. It doesn't mean there weren't people there, it just means the population dispersed and that living on the hilltops is not something they do. Maybe it's conditioned to greater security, you can live down on the fields, or maybe simply different political formations that, that are decentralized. So there are villages throughout Europe from the beginning, from the moment where the first farmers come in, and when the when the when the Romans take over France, or when they begin to march armies north of the Alps, to be more precise, um, many of the societies they encounter are living dispersed in villages and farms, and some of them also have built these enormous, really extravagantly huge hill forts, like Montbeuvray in Burgundy, or Manching in southern Germany, um, or Stradonich in what's now um, the Czech Republic. What was it life in the villages like? Yeah, and what was there? A, what was there hierarchy? And and I'm gonna draw a little bit from Asterix the Obelix here. Was we got the chieftain, of course, and and was was there how much power did they have? And what was what kind of life was it? How was it there? It it looks like there are some rich families from at least the 5th century BC. And we can think about that really because we have very spectacular graves. 
And these graves don't just represent the graves of warriors, but also of other people. So the most famous one is at a site called Vix in Burgundy, V-I-X, where a princess is buried with enormous treasures. And really, you start burying women and children when what you're claiming is that there's something special about your family, not about you as an individual. So there is some kind of a, an existence of aristocracies. And we also see very precious goods traded enormous distances during the Hallstatt. So that might be coral from the Mediterranean or a metalwork from Etruria. Um, objects are moved and then they're concentrated in these uh, in these sort of princely seats they're sometimes called. So I think there were that it's pretty clear the social hierarchy um, from early in the Iron Age. Uh, now what it's uh, get, trying to be more detailed is more difficult. It's difficult to know whether these princely families lasted one generation or ten. Did they dominate their societies um, for long periods, or did they rise and fall quite quickly? When Caesar comes to Gaul, he does say that there are essentially two parts. There's the cavalrymen, he calls them equites in Latin, and there's the followers, and the cavalrymen seem to supply the the chieftains and the druids and the war leaders and the ambassadors and the everybody else is part are part of a sort of huge undefined group. But of course, it may just be that Caesar's not very interested for all he's a popular politician in dis, in dis, differentiating different kinds of commoners. So yeah, it's hierarchical. But within the individual village, it's yeah you know, we can't say for certain, for example, whether like an asterisk there are full time blacksmiths and mm. full time yeah you know, some sometimes in some prehistoric societies people specialize for any part of the year as potters or as blacksmiths or as doctors, and for the rest of the time they're farmers and probably like in most ancient societies, most people in ancient Gaul in in late Latin Europe spent most of their time farming. There was no strength portion, was there? I beg your pardon? There was no strength portion, was there? Oh, um, uh, not as far as we know. No, I, th I don't think so. <laughs> Something I want to discuss as well is because, as, as you know, the Irish are descendants of the, and later the Scots or Picts, as we would call back then, are, are as well descendants from the Gauls. So when did they start in, not invading perhaps, but emigrate into the I Irish? Isles and Ireland, what did they later become Ireland yeah. as well? Um, I'm not one of those people who believes that there's a single Celtic people that spreads all over. Um, I think we can see later languages in Ireland and Wales um, and other places like Cornwall and, and Brittany, which are Celtic languages. It's not true that ancient sources tell us that these people are Celts. Um, the, word, the term Celt, like the term Gaul, is applied to much smaller areas of space. So we don't know that any, even the Romans thought they were a single group, and we certainly don't know that they themselves regarded themselves as part of that. So um, a lot has to do with myth-making in the 19th century. And those people like um, John Collis at Sheffield, um, or Simon James at Leicester, or a variety of French scholars um, who've tracked this down, what they find is that Celticness becomes something that's terribly important in a period of nation building in the 19th century. And in the British Isles, Celticness is one way to express your, your distance from the, the dominant ethnic group, the English. And so pan-Celtic movements often have a very strong sort of political movement, and that's found on a romantic movement. And those people who set up Celtic cultures are kind of opposite to Greek and Latin culture. And people actually sat around inventing Celtic poetry. So the poems of Ossian were invented by, by Scots um, who wanted there to be something equivalent to Homer, um, the origins of Scots. And, and similar things are going on with other languages, with, with, with Romance languages like Provençal in the south of France. And um, yeah, that, that period of nation building in Europe is also a period in which lots of local languages are then sort of reinvented with a literary register. Um, and given you know, people start creating literatures and poems, some which they claim very ancient, some which they don't. So I think the notion of the Celts as a people, particularly as a sort of as Europe wide people, is something that's um, is really about modern history, not about antiquity. You mentioned languages there. So, what kind of languages do we have 
an idea what it might have sounded like or what how widespread you mentioned that there was a hundred over a hundred languages perhaps all, all over the world so how how was that spread no i, I bet there about a hundred languages there were hundreds of languages in the roman empire so mm. oh right um, yeah yeah so it's People who work on Celtic have dif- differentiated two big groups of languages. Um, and they all, I think, accept that there are probably many more dialects within that. And I think probably we should imagine that in the ancient world, all people of the ancient world, most, most languages are quite local. They belong to much larger families. But this is true of Republican Italy, where Oscar and Sabellian and Samnite and Pekin and and, and Latin and so on. They're, they're closely related, but they're not the same. And languages that cover huge areas are really created by imperial states. Um, there are dozens of dialects of Greek in the in the archaic Mediterranean, sort of you know, about 30 odd alpha different version of the Greek alphabet. So um yeah, I think we should always think local when we think about the ancient, the prehistoric world and uh the emergence of the non-local of sort of state languages, official languages, public languages, and then later languages connected to big religions like Islam or Christianity. These are these come later on in the day. So everything starts by being local. And of course, something I want to talk about is the is that in that in, in the Gallic War, Caesar opens with all of Gaul is divided in three parts. Is it really that simple to classify Gaul as divided in three parts with the, let me see here, Belge and Aquanti and, and let me see what, uh, I don't forget the last one, but Celtae, Kel- sorry. Celtae, I think. Celtae, yeah. yeah. Is um, it that simple to classify? No, three no, I, 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 you, you're right. It's not that simple. And, um, it's not quite clear where he got them from. If you read other accounts, like, say, Strabo's Geography, which is written over a long period, but probably around the finished around the early reign of Tiberius, he divides things up a little differently. And, and if we trek further back, eventually, if you go back to, say, the 5th century, it looks like the there's a kind of four-part division where there are Scythians to the east and Celts to the west, and then... Africa, the Persians and Africans. And um, I think ancient geographers made these kind of schematic maps, mental maps, if you like, in the same way that European adventurers did. So Europeans created the category of, of, of Indians for people in North America, when actually we know there were all sorts of different first nations with their own names for themselves and they probably didn't have a collective name for all the people who lived in north north america because they were all the people they knew so um conquering powers i think do tend to schematize a bit to make make big divisions and so, in some places you'll find accounts of kelto siths for example in some account in some accounts there are no germans in other ac- accounts the germans appear um you get celt iberians iberians so Something. So as we, I'm, I'm not talking about unification. I've not talked about. I've not talked about unification. Sorry for a bit now. It has there been an attempt? Because as we know, it was quite divided. It was lo- more local tribes here, uh, here and there. But has there been an attempt by Gaulish leaders to unify Gaul as a whole. It looks like there were increasingly effective alliances against the Romans during Caesar's war. So when Caesar first starts campaigning in 58, clearly some tribes are bigger and more powerful than others, but they're not really joined up in a group. But by the time you get, he's been there five, six years, even he says there are lots of communications between tribes, they rally around particular leaders. Now, Caesar's got an interest himself, of course, into creating a big bad, because you want a big bad so that you can have a big victory. Mm. So maybe Vercingetrix wasn't quite as a sort of dominant a figure as um, as he's presented in the Gallic Wars. But I, I think the arguments are quite strong for tactical and temporary alliances between them. So, and then there are there are traditions which Romans have 
of times red gauze all ruled by one person. But I think these, again, are sort of colonial fictions. They sort of invent a, a, a sort of an archetype that fits with their idea about how things used to be. Something I want to talk about as well, I mean, going to come back to Caesar, of course, by the end of this episode in more detail, but something I want to discuss is the Roman armor and the Roman, ar- sorry, not Roman, but Gallic armies that they had. And something I read in Goldsworth's book, I believe, on the Romans, Roman army, he writes that the Romans actually did kind of steal their hel- form of helmet and they made it in their own, so there must have been... So how, what was the Roman armor and what the Ro- Ro- sorry I keep saying Roman but I meant Gallic, Gallic armor like and Gallic, Gallic army. Yeah, I'm, I mean Adrian Goldsworth is an amazing scholar and he really does know his stuff and and he's absolutely right about this. Um, we can we have a lot of weaponry from late Iron Age late prehistoric Gaul. And that's partly because weapons were devoted to the gods. They were sometimes ritually killed. A sword would be tied in a knot. Sometimes they'd be thrown into rivers or or streams. Sometimes they'd be buried. And sometimes we find them as part of huge monuments after battle. So there's an amazing one at um, uh, in the in Picardy, which um, at Rimos or Ancre, where you have a great collection of human bones and weapons all reassembled into some vast monument so presumably a trophy to intertribal warfare and the romans have nothing to do with that um so we know quite a lot about the weaponry now they are they have a very developed metallurgy so long swords um there are helmets um they don't have wings on them i'm afraid um Mm -hmm. but um uh, but they're sort of um they're, they're small conical helmets. Um, uh, there are also quite a lot of things that are clearly designed to be hung off horses. So we have to have cavalry. And this fits with what Roman accounts say, because one of the things that Romans do want is they want cavalrymen to help. There's very few um, good cavalrymen in, in the Mediterranean. Partly that's just because where it's dry, you don't raise great horses and that Roman armies during the civil wars and then later during the Roman Empire rely a lot on cavalry raised in Gaul and what is now the Low Countries and Netherlands and Batavia and so on. So a lot of the cavalry of the Roman world comes from comes from Northern Europe. And so they have cavalry weapons, they use spears, um, they use slingshots. Then the bow isn't such a big feature for... Um, for Gauls as it is in other parts of the Mediterranean, like Crete or like um, Syria. Um, uh, So projectile weapons would be spears. Um, Mostly their combat would be hand-to-hand and and there are extraordinary shields. Now, unfortunately, most of the shields we've got are so spectacular and so undamaged that they're probably made simply as offerings for the gods. Um, But there are... um, uh, but yeah, that, that they will they look like the assuming they're the kind of shield, the same shape anyway as the ones that ordinary soldiers wore. Then we imagine an army in which people fight with long swords and shields and um, helmets, um, maybe some body armor, but maybe probably not as good as the Roman body armor, which in this period is um, is increasing in sophistication. Um, so chariots. Yeah. Sorry, just last no, year. I mean, yeah. there are so, some parts of the of the Iron Age world they're still fighting from chariots, but this is something which Caesar encounters in Britain, but not in not in France. And uh, chariots are a big feature of military burials from the early Iron Age, um, but only a few areas of Europe are burying people in chariots by the late Iron Age. Something I want to talk about is religion in Gaul, and I assume, as we discussed before, in both uh, around Greek mythology and briefly on Norse mythology, that there was not a common religion that they all didn't worship the same gods. But what was the re- Gaulic religion like, and what did was there separate gods, as in kind of ro- they worshipped separate separate gods in different places, and what how important was the druid in religious religious process? Religion in uh, ancient Gaul. Sorry. Yeah, you get different pictures from different kinds of evidence. So, um, all over Europe, throughout prehistory, people had statues of humans, which most of them are made in wood. So, not many of them survived, but we have got a few that have survived in sort of damp contexts. And there are a few 
particularly in the south, made of stone. And these statues throw, show anthropomorphic beings, some of whom may be heroes, uh, but some of them are probably gods. Um, and there are names which survive in Roman period inscriptions, but they're so un-Roman they must be the same as the, the names the gods had before the Romans got there. So well, Tutatus, famous from the Asterix books, Epona, goddess of... Um, and then there's a number of images that crop up a lot, again, which are very un-Roman. Most gods in Roman Gaul are depicted like Roman gods. They're Hercules and they're Mercury, and they look like Hercules and Mercury anywhere. But um, but there's a few. So there's a god who's always depicted with a great hammer. The name's the god of the mallet. There's a wheel symbols appear quite a lot. So so gods holding wheels, and we don't know quite what this means. Um, there's uh, images of of a of a of a of a of a of a bull appear quite often. So, and there's a in Paris at the site of Notre Dame. Actually, there's an amazing pillar which has on it a whole series of depictions. It's called the Pillar of the Nautai because it's set up by by Roman period um, uh, merchantmen sailors called Nautai. But it depicts a whole series of gods with non-Roman names and non-Roman iconography. So yeah, I think they. They worshipped a whole series of gods. Um, again, probably quite a lot of differences from one region to another. Um, druids mentioned, well, there's no archaeological evidence for druids because, of course, human beings don't leave archaeological traces like that. Um, so we really rely was, on... What... Was druid more like a British thing on the British Isles? Um, Caesar says there are druids in Gaul. He says Britain is the set, the sort centerpiece of it all, um, and most of the sort of stuff that we know about druids comes from Caesar. Um, there's a tra there's a tradition that druids are people who are sort of wise men who teach that the transmigration of souls that when you die your soul goes to a new body, but classical literature is actually rather full of accounts of mystical wise people at the edge of the world. The people in the some of them are clearly based on real people, the Brahmins of India, then the Gymnopsophists of Ethiopia, the Druids in the north, Zalmoxis in Thrace. So they kind of idealise this idea that, that people at the very fringe of the known world might have access to strange wisdom. And then the kind of, then the other version of the Druids that pops up is that they commit human sacrifice. And that is, a, Romans regard this as, as both shocking and dangerous. Yeah, I wanted to ask about the human sacrifice, as you mentioned it. it was, was it common among the Olic religion, or was it rarely? Uh, how, how would we know? I mean, how how how, how can you tell a sacrificed human from another one in a I grave? I mean, archaeological and... evidence uh, must help in this case, as we see in the draw comparison to Carthage. There has been several archaeological finds there where they, where they found ev that should be evidence of the human sacrifice. Yeah, um, there's nothing like a top vet in Gaul, but there are bog bodies, of course, which are known across Europe from Ireland through the Low Countries and Denmark, um, North Germany, and the and some of these anyway, people seem to have been subjected to what we call special treatment, special meals. Some of them a bit of overkill, stabbed and strangled, possibly asphyxiated as well. And I think most of us think that. Um, that the bog bodies, most of them will represent people who have been killed in a ritual manner. Um, that might not be human sacrifice. I mean, sacrifice is all about your intention. It's a gift to the gods. And there are other, other reasons you might kill somebody in a ritual way. For example, you might punish them. They might commit a terrible crime and you might kill them in a particular way. So Greece and Rome had particular... Um, punishments reserved for people who are traitors or who killed their relatives or committed incest or break religious taboos. Um, sometimes some Athenians were forbidden to be buried in their own home country. So we can say it's a ritual killing. That's not quite the same as saying it's a sacrifice in the sense that the kind of things that Greeks and Romans did to animals, these people did to humans. And, and, and again, he... sorry for interrupting you there, but again, I want to draw the comparison to Carthage. I believe Richard and Miles argued that it, though the evidence for the human sacrifice and archaeological evidence could be that a child was already dead and it was dead 
because child death was quite common in those all the way up to modern era basically uh, that it could be burial grave not child sacrifice that it did in, in Carthage so it could be that they were, weren't sacrificed but they were really burial grounds for their dead orphans well Richard knows a lot more about Carthage yeah. than I do I'm I mean, just drawing, I'm just drawing I mean, a if... comparison that it could be that they were natural deaths in other words that it could not necessarily have to be human sacrifice in this case um uh, well i mean the path the carthage the carthaginian stuff um it's very complicated there are particular cemeteries set aside there is a testimony about the moloch ritual but um i agree with richard that we shouldn't jump to conclusions i don't think you can accidentally throttle yourself stab yourself and bury yourself in the bog mm. i think that's quite a difficult one to pull off yeah i think you need a bit the best you need a bit of assisted we have to end assisted suicide, but um, uh, I, I, th I think I think all the evidence suggests the bog bodies are the results of ritual killings. Hmm. So, some something about what I talked about, of course, is the attack on Rome that the Gauls did in early, early late Roman Republic. I don't remember the year in my head on the top of my head now, but how, how it was quite devastating for Romans and something that they would remember for the rest of at least the rest of the, rest of the Republic and all the way up to Caesar's time. Uh, sorry, the, yeah, uh, that's what I was talking about the Rome. Sorry for sorry about that. The Roman Gaulish Gaulish attack on Rome. Sorry if I stutter a little bit this time. Well, that's right. What 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 did you want to ask about it? Uh, no, no. If you could talk about the Gaulish. Oh, right, yes, okay, Rome. yes. Um, sorry, if, sorry if I was hesitant, stuttering a little bit there, but you know, that's that's what I wanted to get to. Uh, no, that's fine. Um, the the several instances during the fifth and fourth, third centuries where large and actually later as well, when large groups of people come out of Central Europe or come south of the Alps and and launch attacks on populations. And there's a famous one where Delphi is sacked by, by troops. And then there's a uh, the three Gallic tribes established themselves in central Turkey. Um, some of these are better recorded than others, but there is but one of them is the big attack on the city of Rome. And there's other, other attacks too in Etruria and Naples and so on, or the Bay of Naples. Uh, the, the Romans do make a big Thing of this i mean it's important in their collective mythology that once upon a time very early in the roman republic that um that the gauls were uh that that rome was um defeated by the gauls and that the city of rome all of it or part of it was occupied and this fits into their mythology in several ways for one thing they do is they say well one reason the city of rome is so is so sort of chaotic and disordered compared to Greek cities is that it um, was um, rebuilt in a hurry after the Gallic sack. Um, and um, then there's the story about the geese giving the warning on the Capitol that the Gauls were creeping up and so the sacred geese squawk and the Roman fight them off. So this is a sort of sign of the gods helping the Romans. Just There's similar myths about the gods helping at Delphi to get rid of the Gauls. So, yeah, it's... It resonates through Roman culture. Um, money is set aside in, against um, Gallic attacks. Many of the early uh, Roman laws refer to tumultus Gallicus, the Gallic um, emergency. I mean, one thing I might want to say here is that the Roman category of Gaul is it's their category. And these people who in historical times lived north of the Apennines in the valley of the Po, between the Alps and the Apennines and on the in the Marche, they may not have many close connections to people north of the Alps, that um, it's Romans who decide there's a single people, the Gauls, and there's a political reason for this. It allows Caesar to claim that defeating the Gauls is a kind of historic revenge. And just like at other times, he claims that defeating particular Gallic tribes is revenge for the invasion of the Cimbrian Teutones, who we normally classify as Germans. Um, who marched through North Italy and Southern France and Spain in the late second century BC. So these ethnic categories, which we get through historical writing, they've often been manipulated. They've often been sort of um, 
yeah, reworked. In, and part of the reason people do elaborate this notion of what the wild people in the north are like is because at the same time, they're developing a notion of how different they are, how they're really civilized. They live in cities, they have laws and so on. So um, I think I think this, the, the work that's been done most recently is particularly great book by Jonathan Williams, the British Museum called Beyond the Rubicon on this, um, tells us a lot about Roman sense of self and how it changed over time. And maybe not so much about the actual events of the of the fourth century BC. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, of course, let's talk about the elephant in the room. I mentioned this quite a few times in the episode, but I want to go in more detail now, which is uh, Caesar's attack on Gaul, on Gaul, which was, of course, illegal. So he's sent, right, to Gaul as a governor, and he it's kind of more to get rid of him because he's becoming kind of a big player back in Rome. So what what makes him decide... I'm, you know what, I'm gonna, even though it might be illegal, and it's kind of the only way for me to get... Was it the only way for him to get back mm -hmm. to Rome if he to launch this 10-year mm -hmm. war on Gaul? I, I see it a bit differently to you, I think. Um, Caesar is part of a, of a small group of people who take control of the Roman state by force, the, the, the first triumvirates, what we call them. And part of this alliance... Um, it gives each of the main players, Caesar, Pompey and Crassus, the stuff they want. And um, what Caesar wants most of all uh, is, is money and military glory. I mean, Crassus already has money. Pompey already had his military glory. Caesar wants both. And you're right, in the long term, it's a design to come back and, and do better within Roman politics. But it's Caesar who makes sure that he is given up that province in, in northern Italy. Um, the orig originally his enemies tried to give him another one, which would which would have occupied him in a, in a rather trivial sort of road management matter. So Caesar's given the job there, and it looks to begin with as if he's sitting in this area of North Italy, which um, which is called Gaul south of the Alps, um, or Gaul across the Po Valley, across the Po River. And it looks like he's originally plotting to march northeastwards and to fight a war in the northern Balkans, perhaps against the Dacians, who lived in um, what's now part of Western Romania. And then he has added to this province the area of southern France. So he's got two Gallic provinces then. So, so he's used his political muscle to build up the amount of prov number of provinces he has, and this this air one that runs from the Alps down to the Apennine, down to the Pyrenees. I'm sorry, um, is exposed to the north to the interior Gaul. Now, while he's there, he sees a much better opportunity for war, um, and this is that the one of the Gallic tribes, um, the Helvetii, who live on the Swift Plateau, is proposing to migrate through Roman territory. Roman allies are worried by this, and so on this basis. Caesar goes to war. Now, he would say, not he would say, well, it isn't illegal. It's actually my duty. I'm defending a Roman ally that is being threatened by a barbarian people. Mm. And so he presents this first the war against the Helvetii, and then the one that follows against Ariovistus and the Germans as, as Rome defending friends and allies, the Roman people. And gradually there's a sort of mission creep. So to begin with, he just tries each individual war, these people mistreated Roman merchants. These people were threatening to come into the province. Pretty clearly, he he's moving towards a position where he's just conquering for the sake of conquering. And what he wants to claim is that he's got to the Atlantic, that he's crossed the ocean to Britain, that he's crossed the Rhine to Germany. He's the first person to campaign in these areas. The stand of comparison then, I think, is his rival Pompey, who has done got taken armies in the Easter places that the Romans had never been to, the Caspian Sea, for example. So um, I'm not sure if it's illegal. It was certainly It was according to the Senate, I think. I think they looked at it as an illegal war. I don't think that's right, actually. Really? That's the way I... I, I don't seem to think that is the way I, the way I understood the, it. The, he has enemies in the Senate, including the younger Cato, who criticizes him for the way in which he treated Ariovistus. Um, as far as we know, the account that Caesar gets days of thanksgiving declared in Rome is correct. The Senate's very divided at this period. There are 
people on Caesar's side and people against Caesar. And there's people who are trying to split the triumvirate up. So people like Caesar are trying to detach Pompey and Caesar from each other to, to break up this alliance. Um, there are tribunes like Mark Antony who are sort of working for Caesar. Um, so it's a it's a complicated political situation. And um, and then there's the, the Senate isn't the only body, of course. There's also the assemblies and the assemblies uh, are groups with which Caesar is very popular. So, of course, they get quite a lot of slaves from this one million, which is a huge, tremendous number of slaves. Yes, and, it's, it's horrific. And um, let's talk about an, another brilliant tactic of Caesar that he, he at the end of the war, that where he actually decided to build a wall and then another wall. Where does it go? How does this tactic work of building another wall around the, the again, first wall? Oh, uh, wh- wh- the, the wall when it when it build the wall. I'm sorry, when it, the wall against to fortify. fortify oh, you mean around Alasia, yeah. the siege yeah, of Alasia? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it, most of the early battles are fought in the field, sort of um, like Battle of Sombra and so on. But the, towards the end, they become more like siege conflicts, and there are these enormous fortifications built um, a long time before Caesar. Um, entered Gaul that these some these some of these really big hill forts were built in the second century BC and we don't really know why or or by whom but near the end of the conflict with Vercingetorix it centers on a, a siege and um what Caesar who gives the very detailed account of the siege is trying to do is is both to keep the the people in Alasia in so that they have to feed themselves and run out of food. He doesn't want them to reduce their numbers. He's basically starving them out, like in any siege. But he's also trying to stop anyone coming to rescue them. So so the outer fortification designed to prevent other people getting in. So it's a it's a complicated, long drawn out siege. It's it's one of the ones we know best about. We know a bit about the siege of Numantia in Spain in the previous century. And of course, we know a lot about the siege of Masada, but for for Roman siegecraft, Elysia is really a sort of um, yeah, it's 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 the great example. Yeah, we we discussed this in in the episode a few we made a few years ago on the Roman army about how he would use this, I believe, rods sticking down the ground, and this is one of the reasons that can't believe that they kind of called him a tyrant in this way because it was. If you stepped on those rods, it would have been quite hurt quite a lot, right? It's one of the reasons why they kind of looked at him in as a tyrant. It wasn't common use weapon weapon in Roman warfare, was it? I, I don't know, because I think we know so much in, in so much more detail about this siege than we do about other ones that it's not always easy to tell when he's doing something new or when he's applying something we just haven't heard of mm. before. But see, siege warfare is a big bit of um of Greek warfare back in the fifth century, and think about the siege of Plataea that uh, that Thucydides narr- narrates, or the way in which Athens built the long walls to protect itself so it could be provisioned by sea. And actually, people got very interested in sieges later, and we even have sort of um, textbooks where they've cut siege narratives out of a whole bunch of other histories and put them together. And then there are themes that keep popping up, like. The person who finds the way to climb up into the supposedly impregnable citadel, or um, or the traitor inside the walls, or or the cunning technical invention. So Archimedes' is cunning device to 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 dis- destroy Roman siege engines at Syracuse. So I think this is part of the way you write about sieges in the ancient world. It's about a sort of a highly localized sort of arms race developing more and more successful or unsuccessful machines to get in or out of cities. So in the end, of course, he wins the wins the war against the Gauls. And I want to talk before at the end now about Gaul under Roman rule. So when did it what is that like? How did it get governed and how how did they eventually build this Roman cities and baths in there? And how well did they adjust to Roman rule in Gaul? It's a long story with lots of phases to it. And the the Caesar's Gallic War, of course, he presents it as being a victory, but 
what actually happens is war breaks out between him and Pompey, and so he le- he withdraws his troops, most of them, to go and fight civil wars. Among them, and, of course, the infamous Tenth Legion. Um, yeah, um, others, yes. But um, so also withdraws quite a lot of his Gallic allies. So we find people who he made allies of in Gaul end up fighting other Romans around the Mediterranean. And the period that's most mysterious is is really this period between the end of Caesar's operations there, so the end of the 50s, and the period where we can see Augustus and his um, and his lieutenants like Agrippa and then his sons, Drusus and Tiberius, operating. So we've got about a generation where it's not very clear what's going on. There are clearly Roman camps in Gaul. The Gauls are mostly peaceful, but not always. Um there isn't yet a Roman frontier in a meaningful sense, and then out and then out of all this, with the Augustan settlement, you begin to get in Gaul as elsewhere a more stable system. They introduce censuses and tax people. Um, the old tribes get turned into most of them into what are effectively communities organised on Roman lines. So the the Idui, which is one of the most powerful tribes that Caesar encounters and works with. Um, it still exists. There's still a kivitas of the Idui under Roman rule, but now they're no longer ru- living in a hill fort on, on Bibracti. In the Morva, they've now established a sort of sort of model Roman town with theatres and forum and all the rest of it, some couple of kilometres away on the plain. And, and that story is repeated all over that, um, people come down from the hills if they were in the hills, or they come together from villages if they were scattered in villages, and they coagulate or are brought together or are maybe even compelled to live in new-build towns. And the new-build towns in the first generation, they have spectacular temples and probably everybody else is living in sort of wooden houses and huts. And, and it takes another generation or two before because you have to open up quarries you have to train people to work in particular ways so building roman cities isn't something you can do overnight i mean even though there are not many cities in gaul there's maybe less than 100 sort of uh, proper cities as opposed to sort of towns with urban aspirations yeah it takes two or three generations to get them built and to the point where we begin to get you what you and i associate we think of a roman town with proper roads and and drains and and in some cases, walls and so on. And um, the monuments then go up. In Gaul, it's particularly temples, places of entertainment. That means theatres, amphitheatres, circuses. Sometimes in smaller places, buildings that can do all of these jobs at the same time. So you get this sort of a kind of theatre that's modified. So there's an arena instead of a stage. So you can stay, you can have... Um, animal hunts or gladiatorial games or drama, depending on how you feel like it. Mm. Um, and and the most famous towns here, they they're quite they're, they're quite wealthy because they sit on top of enormous territories compared to Italian or Spanish ones. The territories of these tribes are very large, most of them. And then most of this monument building sort of stops in Gaul before two hundred. Stops even earlier in the south. Maybe they're just finished. Maybe they, they've done all the got all the monuments they need. So Roman cities are in Gaul are really a big deal for the first two centuries AD. And during those two centuries, for a lot of cities, they're still works in progress. They're building sites. People are generation after generation. So it's rather like the generations who built Gothic cathedrals. You know, sometimes the people who started the cathedral be dead before it was finished. It's a huge sort of collective social effort. Um, and in the meantime, yes, the, the, the upper echelons are coming to adopt Roman ways of eating and drinking and dressing and portraying themselves. Some bits of their life are still more distinctive. Women's headdresses and, and costumes still look more different province to province than do men's because they don't have the same access to public life. Um, the gods still are quite different in Roman Africa than Roman Spain and Roman Gaul, even when they sometimes have the same names. Um, 
Latin is a public language. We don't really know how many people spoke it. Maybe in the fields and villages, other languages remained important throughout antiquity. But the only language written down from the end of the first century was Latin, a tiny bit of Greek. Um, and the richest of these people who'd gone through a Roman education system and Roman training, they serve in the Roman army. Some of them um, get promoted into the second aristocracy of Rome, the equites, the, some of them then end up governing, leading detachments of troops elsewhere in the empire. Uh, some of them end up as, um, not many of them become senators, a few do, but, uh, but more from the south than from the north. Um, and we don't know of any Roman emperors who are descended from aristocrats, from, not from inland Gaul, from the area Caesar conquered, or from Britain or Germany, but some from, some from the south of Gaul. So, um, so that, that there is a there is a slow connecting up. Um, probably, if you there are, if, if you go if you if you were to go to dinner with one of the wealthy men in the city of Otar, um, you'd see Roman mosaics and you'd hear Latin spoken and you'd eat Roman style food and drink wine from Italy and you could imagine yourself as almost in Italy, but if you then went out in the countryside, it probably wouldn't take you very long before you realised that it was still a different country. And, and, you know, that would, something similar would have applied in Africa or in Spain um, or any other part of the Roman Empire, that it's connected at the very top by the elites, by the educated classes, and it remains a spectacularly diverse territory at all other social ranks. But there wasn't a massive, like it would be with Boudicca in Britain years later, it wasn't a, too many massive rebellions, was there, in, during Roman occupation? There were a few. There was one in um, in um, Tiberius's reign, led by Florus and Sacrovir. All the leaders seem to have Roman citizenship, and they're from tribes that have been very loyal to Rome, so we're not quite sure what happened there. And then during the Roman Civil War of 68-70, um, there's clearly some groups who want to create an Imperium Galliarma, a Gallic Empire that looks like the Roman one, but is run by Gauls. And um, they're probably underreported. Romans were in the imperial period tended to play down these revolts. And um, so there's, there's a little bit, but by and large, by and large, it's a relatively secure situation. Yeah. Something that fascinates me is, even though, of course, uh, this is way after the, the process, probably thousand or so years after almost the the Rome fell, and they're still in the east referred to as, and I mentioned her before in Alexia, she referred to the Franks as Celts still, and they're still at least in the east referred to as Celts even in the medieval era, at least by the eastern. Roman Empire and the Eastern it is, Yes, it's extraordinary, isn't it? I mean, it, it. I think it really just comes back to the point I made earlier about the way that these ethnic labels change a lot. And um, yes, the Franks are called Celts, but uh, uh, one of the most common words for foreigners in Arabic is Farangi, and Farangi means mm. Frank, of course. So it's isn't Farangi as well a race in Star Trek? Uh, yes, that's true, isn't it? Yes, yes. I, I wonder <laughs> how they got that idea, yeah. So, so, yeah, thank you so much for coming on. It's been a pleasure to talk to you about ancient Gaul. Before you go, do you have anything you want to promote? Any links you want me to put in the description below or any social media where people might find you? Um, I don't think so. I mean, I've written a few books on this, which I expect people will, uh, some people will know Becoming Roman is the, is the one about Romanization and tales the barbarians about ancient ethnicity and so on. And, um, but um, otherwise, I think I think that's it. So um, very nice to talk to you. Thanks for having me on the podcast. Thank you so much for coming on. This has been with That Age Well. We are available on Spotify, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, wherever you can find podcasts these days. If you are on Apple Podcasts, please consider writing a little review of the podcast. That will help us out a lot. And again, please like, share and subscribe. And I'll see you next time.